But the general public has a, a great misconception about what the church is. And I think by and large, I would say that the general public views the church, I'm talking about the church in all kinds of uh, religious bodies, would view it as a benevolent society, as a way to get something uh, that is physical. We get a number, a number of calls for help with the electric bill. A man at one time uh, cursed my wife because the church would not buy him a generator for his car. And thus the public has this concept of the church as a great benevolent society. And it's not the fault of the general public. Too many groups of people down to the ages in the past years have catered to that appetite. They have not demonstrated the concern for man's soul, his spiritual needs, but rather for his physical needs. And so as a result, the general public has that concept of the church. And then I think about the a religious world, by that I mean the many religious bodies that are in our country. And I think about what is their concept of religion? What is their concept of the church? Now, obviously, again, man's present needs are emphasized. There was a great uh, man in the, or thought to be great, in the latter part of the 1800s, who was one of the last of the restorers who said this. He said for too long a time, that is, during the period of the Restoration, the 1800s, that we have been concentrating upon man's future needs. He said that people, by and large, cannot relate to that, so what we need to do is to change our approach to people and appeal to their present needs. And he became a prophet, because that's what's happened. Both churches will appeal to the present needs of people, as we're going to see tonight. And without a doubt, the concept of both in the religious world is that of a social concept of the church. A social concept. We get calls there at East Side about whether or not we have a ball club, whether or not we have a softball team that plays in the league. A friend of mine, back when I was growing up, he was wanted to attend a particular church, but to play in a softball team, he had to attend one service a month. And that was too stringent, so he left and went somewhere else. His concept of the church is purely social. And as we look about in our newspapers and see the advertisements, we do not have to convince us that they have a misconception of what the church is. It's a social concept, social importance, men's clubs, women's clubs, auxiliary groups. That's what we find in the religious world. So as we go about knocking on doors or talking to our neighbor about the New Testament church, we find that we have to begin with the most simple teaching of the New Testament. Because by and large, to have a complete uh, erroneous view of, of what the church is, and really have no conception at all of what the New Testament church is involved with. I had a person tell me not too long ago that, that you mean to say that you believe that religion is to control our very life. They said, now with me, it's just a very, it's a part of my life. I give so much time to it, but it certainly doesn't control the whole life. The point I'm making in the beginning, in this introduction, is that people by and large do not know what the New Testament church is. And that's why it's necessary for us, as simply as we can, without getting involved in any dictionaries or any big terms, any fancy explanations, be able to take our New Testament and say, now here's what the New Testament church is. Here's what the church is. And then tonight I want to look at the question for what the church spent its money. And I think after the answer to the first question, the second will be easy. Well, let's begin very quickly by looking at it. one point about authority. We suggest that the source of authority for determining what the church is is not what men have written. Apostle Paul makes that clear in Colossians 2, verses 20 through 23. Where Paul says that we ought not to appeal to the doctrines of men. And yet in the world today we find so many doctrines that have been written. Well, let me suggest that when I decide for myself what the New Testament church is, I must not do it based upon men have said. Nor do I do it based upon what preachers say. What I say about what the church is, or Dave, or Keith, or Carl, it doesn't matter. After all the said and done, it, it is determined by what God says the church is. No man, no preacher has the right to make that a determination of what the church actually is. 
It's interesting in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, a passage we know well, Paul says to preach the word. Too many preachers get in trouble because they don't preach the word. They preach their opinions or their ideas and about the church. Preachers need to preach the word about what the church is. Now and end, down in West Tennessee, love her very dearly. But the authority in the church for her rests in the hands of the elders. A few years ago, the church there put a kitchen in the building and began having supper at various times and on occasions. And I asked her about it. Her answer was, well, the elders decided that it was all right and they could hold it. And I must submit to them, so there's the authority. Rest in the eldership. Those of you who are older and those who have read concerning the institutions back in the 50s and 60s with the colleges are aware that this very same argument was used. For the polius there at the college said, that, well, churches send money in, elders send money in, and I would not want to interfere with their work as elders to refuse that money. Well, the point of the matter is, elders are not the authority in the church to determine what the church is or what the church may or may not do. Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, I believe it makes it very clear. When he says, Then the flock of God, which is among you, exercising the oversight, not of constraint, but willingly, according to the will of God. The, the authority of the elders rests upon that very statement. They must rule according to the will of God. So the authority of what the church is and what the church may spend its money for does not rest in the hands of the elders. We understand there are many decisions made about the money, which does. As far as what the church may spend its money for, what's right and what is not right, certainly is not determined by elders. Nor is it determined by the results that are accomplished. Men point to colleges and orphans' homes and old folks' homes, and they say, look at the good being done. Well, we understand that because the end result may have some good in it of some type, does not mean that the whole thing is right. In other words, the end does not justify the means to accomplish it. This, of course, is an example of it. Now that he was moving the ark of God, it was a good work. But what happened? He lost his life. Because he did not do it as God had instructed him and others to do it. And I don't know of a better illustration to show that the results accomplished are not the authority. But the source of authority is Christ. Hebrews 1, verse 2. We find that the apostle says, but has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And thus Jesus today is the authority. He's the only authority that we have. Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus says, But all authority or power has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. All authority rests with Christ. And that's why I must be at Paul in Colossians 3.17. And say that whatsoever we do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord, no matter what it is. And as we think about what the church is, the church must be exactly what Jesus determined that the church ought to be. Exactly what Jesus says it is. <clears throat> That's what the church must be to please God. And that the church that I'm a part of is anything but that which God would have to be that I'm not a part of the New Testament church. Thus, each of us must search our hearts and God's Word to see if we are actually a part of the New Testament church. One day we'll face God in judgment and be judged partly upon that basis, whether or not we're part of the New Testament church. And thus, in the beginning, we want to make the point that the source of authority rests solely with Christ. But now let's take a look at some passages that really tell us what the church actually is. I'm going to put this all up here at once. We have a good number of young people who've been copying these down, and I appreciate their interest. They'll be able to get all of it down. Notice with me, first of all, that the church is simply a called out body of people. And I pointed out that I don't know anything about the Greek, but here's a word that's used in the New Testament, which simply means a called out people. Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's notice a couple verses there. 1 Peter chapter 2, the, the apostle says, He also has living stones are built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Because it is contained in Scripture, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. He that believeth on him shall not be put to shame. For you therefore that believe is a preciousness, but for such as disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, the same was made the head of the corner, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a, an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possessions. Ye may show forth the excellencies of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who in time past were no people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This passage goes a long way in helping us to understand what the church is. We find that the church is a called out people, those who have been called out of the world. We can look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. And there notice the apostle Paul talks about being translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, the kingdom of his dear son. The church is a called out body of people. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the latter part of that chapter. The Apostle Paul talks about how the church ought to come out of the world in the way they live and in the things they practice. And thus the church is a called out body of people. Let me suggest again from verse 5 and also other verses that the church is made up of those who are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. No one is in the church without the blood of Christ. No one could be acceptable to God were it not for the blood that Christ shed. We know that the enmity existed between man and God because of man's sin. And in Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul lays forth for us the preeminence of Christ. And how, verses 18 through 20, that it was God's pleasure or God's will to reconcile or to make peace with man through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then look with me in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1. As we look at a couple of verses, but Paul says, Be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but suffer hardship with the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us for the holy calling, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before times eternal, but hath now been manifested by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death, Draw life and immortality to life through the gospel. And how thankful we are for that. We have life in Christ, as Paul says again in Romans chapter 5. And thus the church are those who are acceptable to God. And again, we go back to our first thought. Acceptable to God, not upon man's basis, but upon the standard that God has set for us. And we continue to notice that the church is simply those who are added to the body of the saved. Sometimes it's good to have a mistake of transparency just to see a poster away. <laughs> Those people who are added to the body or the body, it'd be the way of the slave. Look with me in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 47. Of course, Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, some 3,000 souls repented and were baptized into Christ. They accepted the gospel, responded to it. And then in verse 47, notice what's said. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to them day by day those that were saved. The King James, though the Lord added to the church, such as were being saved. But the church is simply those who are added to the body of the saved. Let me suggest to you, this means that one is not in Christ, he's not saved unless he's in the church. Again, a very basic lesson. Salvation is in Christ, Paul said. We're baptized into Christ. The Bible teaches one must be baptized, be in Christ, and be added to the Lord's church. Then in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, I think a key point, perhaps, as I view the question we're going to discuss in just a few moments. Perhaps one of the most important things to notice about the church is that it is a body of people for which Christ died. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20, as we notice there, verse 28. The apostle says, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops, to feed the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. We find the same thought again in Ephesians 5. Jesus is the Savior of the body. 
The church is that body of people that were purchased or redeemed by the blood of Christ. We're going to be emphasizing that point in just a moment. Notice also in Ephesians chapter 5 that the church is spoken of as being the bride of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we find as we read a moment ago, the church is spoken of as being a holy priesthood. Not just a few men in the hierarchy of the church are priests, but all believers in Christ who are obedient to the gospel are priests. They make up a holy priesthood. They are a spiritual house. And notice again this word spiritual. They are a spiritual house. Let me suggest to you that a spiritual house concerns itself with spiritual service and with spiritual work. Again, a very key point. And in verse 10, they are the people of God. And as the people of God, we find the Apostle Peter says, and they are to show for the excellencies of Christ. There are other points we can look at. But as we take our New Testament, it is not difficult to find out what the church is. Not based upon what I think or upon what someone else may think or upon a book that's been written, but upon the New Testament, the will of Jesus Christ. Now this is what the church is. And notice again some key words. Called out of the world, in Colossians chapter 3, they set their affections on things that are above, not on things that are below. In other words, we're not concerned primarily with this line. We see in Hebrews chapter 11, reading about Abraham and others, they search for a kingdom and a city whose builder and maker is God. They look for a city, not kingdom, a city whose builder and maker is God. Now let's go on. We notice several points this evening. You notice what the church is. I want to notice with you for just a moment what the church is not. There are several things that the church is not. We talked a minute ago about Acts 20, 28, and then in Ephesians chapter 5. We pointed out that the church was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Something that I never have been able to conceive of is here is God in heaven. Sends his son to earth, he watches him suffer. Watches he spat upon as he's uh, rejected by his own people. Watches him go before Pilate, go before Herod, and goes back to Pilate. He's tried, false charges are brought against him, and here God watches all this take place. God watches as Israel cries out, crucify him, crucify him. And God looked down as the nails were driven through his hand, the spear put the spear put the side, and then to accept. And the reason God did that, and the thing that motivated God to do that, was so we can have a social club. Now, can you imagine that? What would we think of Father today who sacrificed his son so there could be a social club? And I think, as I consider the whole matter, to me. That's the most outstanding point to be made. For what did Christ die? For what was the blood of Jesus Christ shed for? Let me suggest that it was not a social club, and it was not a political party. Many of the great leaders today in various churches are involved themselves in politics. The moral majority and other movements, again, they've lost sight of what's important. Not important what the laws of the land are and so forth, but we contemplate that men's souls are being lost because they're not being taught the gospel of Christ. Let me suggest that Jesus did not die for a political party, nor for a political cause. Jesus in his own actions demonstrated that his primary concern was not this world. They sought to make him king. The Jews in the first century, as they interpreted what they thought the Old Testament was talking about, and as they were no doubt motivated by their own greed, they were looking for a king. And they saw Jesus come with all of his powers, and they saw all the benefits to a nation that had a leader such as Christ. And they sought to make him king. And it's interesting today that so many people are looking for the day when Jesus is going to be made king on earth. The very thing that Jesus refused while he was on earth. Jesus was not concerned about this life. He was concerned 
about the, the life which is to come. And that's what we must do. Come to understand that the church concerns itself with men's souls, not with the recreation center. It is not a business. It is not to be in the education field. The question again is asked, did Christ die with his blood shed for these things? If this is what people think the church is and ought to be involved in, then it seems that this is what they would have to conclude that Jesus Christ died for. And I do not hope anything else that is so blasphemous as this. What did Jesus die for? Each of us ought to be thinking that his blood was shed for our sins. That when I take my New Testament and teach my neighbor, I have confidence that he can be saved from his sins because Christ died and shed his blood. The very idea there in Athens, saying uh, family life centers and such like, all done in the name of religion. In the name of the church. Look what the church is doing. We see this all about us. It's a sad state, isn't it? It goes back to what really people think what the church is. Their conception of the church. We as God's people need to work hard and we need to work long to educate the people in this community wherever we might live as to what the church is. We need to be very basic. The elders told me just four weeks ago we were meeting and they said, Jerry, what we want you to do in your preaching is to teach the basic simple lesson of what the church is, what faith is, what repentance is. And I see some wisdom in what they say. They recognize that they're on east side in Limestone County, many churches. They realize that young people are growing up and they are not forming a conviction on what the church is or what the church may spend its money for. And parents, let us not assume that 10 or 20 years down the road, our children will believe and teach the truth concerning the church. Not unless we do our work now. That's why young people tonight study with them. Look in your Bible to find out what the church is and notice that this is not what the church is. And that certainly is not what our Lord died for. Mm -hmm. Well, let's think about a question for a moment. What did the church use its money for? And I think by this time, we come to understand that if we really consider what the church is, we think about it from the Bible standpoint that it's a spiritual establishment. Concerned about spiritual things. Concerned about the eternal destiny of men's souls, more so than the present need of this life. Too many of us, too many in the world, cannot see beyond today. We see the need we have today, and that clouds our thinking as to things that are really important. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, we find there that money that the church has is to be raised or is to be gathered by an offering on the first day of the week. Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I gave order to the churches of Galatia, so also do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him in store, as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. Now that verse doesn't read that way in everybody's Bible. There are those that say, and let's take the money, let's put it in account and grow of interest, let the Lord's money may increase both. Let me suggest to you that such violates God's law. I simply do not see any authority in the church raising money in any way other than the contribution of saints in the first day of the week. There are those brethren who practice that and who attempt to defend it. But let me suggest that thus far, to me, they have not defended it by God's word. One passage has been used. Matthew chapter 25, the parable of talents. But think about it. What did Jesus teach in the parable of talents? First of all, to the individual, but secondly, to use what you have. And for church to take a sum of money, $10,000, $20,000, and put it in a savings account, put it in certificate bearing notes, and then to use Matthew 25 to justify the interest. Now certainly they're wearing blankets. That's the whole point of teaching Jesus. Let me suggest to you the church ought not to be involved in giving money to church through interest 
Going through bingo, Bobby had a good number call here in West Bend about what night the church played bingo. Well, what business does a spiritual body of people have playing bingo? Churches earn money by having bingo. They get a certain percentage of what the bingo games earn. I remember several years ago down in Milwaukee, the controversy there with the Catholic Church who began serving beer at bingo games. And the taverns in the area objected to it because of getting part of their revenue. Now these things are sad, but goes back to this conception of what the church is. The money of the church comes from contributions from the first day of the week by Christians. And that's all that I can find the Bible says about it. Well, after we have this money, what can we use it for? Well, we use it for the work of the church. Let me suggest that it's threefold. One is simply uh, preaching the gospel of Christ. We know from what the Bible says that the Lord's money may be used for that purpose. To preach the gospel of Christ. I believe the Bible is very clear if we look some passages together. That the money may be used to preach the gospel of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 8 and 9. Paul talks about his church at Corinth. He said, I arrived in other churches taking wages of them. Then look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. As the Apostle Paul talks about his right to be supported by the gospel of Christ. Look it down at verse 14. He was told that the Lord ordained that they that proclaim the gospel should live of the gospel. Look at verses prior to that, and you see the point very clearly that Paul is making. As Paul writes to the church of Philippi in Philippians 1 5 and Philippians 4 10 through 17, Paul was thankful for the money and whatever was sent to him to support him in the preaching of the gospel of Christ. The young people, you need to become familiar with these verses. When you see these passages, you need to realize that here is what the New Testament says about spending money to preach the gospel of Christ. It's right that the church may do that with its money. Not because I said or anybody said it, but because that's what we read in the New Testament. You find in Ephesians chapter 4 that the church also is to edify itself, that is, to build itself up. Ephesians 4, 12, for the perfecting of the saints, the work of ministry, unto the building up the body of Christ. Verse 16, from whom all the body is fitly framed and knit together, through that which every joint supplies, according to the working and due measure of each several part, make it the increase of the body of the building up of itself in love. <coughs> the church is to continually be building itself up, be edifying itself. Well, that involves several things. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23, the Apostle Paul talks about the whole church coming together. Hebrews 10, 25, the writer says, To forsake not the assembly of yourself together as a matter of some years. Acts 20, verse 7, it says, Upon the first day of the week, the disciples met together to bring bread. Well, this necessitates having some place to meet. It can be out in a farmer's field under a tree. And it can be in a house. It can be in a building. Some means must be provided for the church to meet the obligation of half edify itself to be able to take the Lord's Supper. And thus here a building is justified because it's used the church performing the work, doing the work that God has told her to do. To edify itself. And how many times has this principle been abused and been misused? Where you have the church involved in all kinds of things and well we're simply edifying the church. Let's build a kitchen so that we can have fellowship in the fellowship hall. But again, a misunderstanding of what fellowship is. What's involved with New Testament fellowship? The church may spend money to edify itself. And as I study my New Testament, I find that the church may spend its money to care for needy saints. To care for needy saints. Nowhere in the New Testament are you going to find a passage that says the church took money out of the treasury to care for anyone who was not a need of something. Back a few years ago, you're familiar with the story that was told about the church not caring for small infants and would allow them to starve and go cold and hungry in the wintertime. Brother Urban Lee, 
talk with one either on a certain day when he made some interesting observations. He says as he looks back over that period of time, he does not believe that it was ever the orphan home that was, that was motivating money taken out of the treasury to support a human institution. And those men who were foremost behind it were not those who really wanted to take care of orphans, but the ones who wanted to take money out of the treasury to support the colonies. And I think he had the right to speak. And I think I'm going to respect his observations as well as observations of others. It was not the small starving orphans they were concerned about. It was a college and school which they felt needful to train men to preach the gospel of Christ and to be able to carry on this in a big way as those about us. I find that to be an interesting observation. But as I look at these verses, I find the church was busy caring for needy saints. In each one of these instances, you find that it was specified they were caring for brethren, were caring for the needy saints. Well, as I look at my New Testament about what the church is, and then I consider the question, what did the church spend its money for? And this is the only thing I find. And that leaves out a whole lot, doesn't it? Well, that leaves out just a whole number of things that some of our brethren are involving themselves in. I'm not going to talk about these, but just a few, I could make a list a mile long. But it doesn't talk about a gymnasium, it doesn't talk about a kitchen, it doesn't talk about a fellowship hall, it doesn't talk about orphan homes, it doesn't talk about colleges, it doesn't talk about family life centers, and on and on we go. Well, what happened in the church? Let me suggest that God's people through the years forgot what the church is. Is that something? They simply lost sight, and they forgot the answer to the very basic question, what is the church? They forgot. And as Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And that's what happened in the Lord's church. Many of God's people are perishing, groping in all of this because they simply <laughs> forgot what the church is. And that's why I think this lesson is timely for young and old. Let us never lose sight of what the church is. And I think as long as we keep that concept properly before us, we'll never have a problem. See, the church ought not to be involved in any activities. We'll never have a problem being able to determine whether or not the church is spending money for various things. We know what the church is. Parents, let's teach our children. Let's teach our children what the church is. Create in them a love and appreciation for the Lord's church. Christ died for the same man. You might be here this evening. And you're not a Christian. And Jesus did not die for things such as we see on the screen. But Jesus died that you might be saved from your sin. God so loved the world and gave it only to the God of the Son. There's the love of God expressed to us. Jesus said in John 8, verse 24, that except you believe in me, you shall die in your sins. If you believe tonight that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, who came and died on the cross for your sins. To be motivated by the gospel of Christ, the good news about Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. This evening, be obedient to the gospel of Christ. Be motivated by that good news and be baptized in the Christ. If you're not a Christian, why not do that?